Uh, so welcome everyone to the ODI and our latest um, lunchtime lecture. Um, we're very happy to have Matt here today from Data.World, who's going to be talking to us about the US government and its data and how it can be used to improve the lives of citizens. Um, just a couple of things from me before we get started. Um, please do hold on to your questions until the end and we'll pass around the microphone. Um, and for those watching online, please use the, the hashtag ODI Fridays to get your questions in. Um, and with that, I'll pass it on to you, Matt. Great. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Matt Lessig from uh, Data.World. I'm very happy to be here today uh, at ODI's lunchtime lecture and to talk to you guys about the history of the open data movement in the U.S. government. We've been uh, longtime fans of ODI and are proud to be members and supporters that they do some incredible work advocating for open data. Um, so just a, a moment here on who we are, data.world. We're really a platform for open data science and sharing and collaboration. Um, if you read our mission statement here, it's we're building the most meaningful, collaborative, and abundant data resource in the world by dismantling the barriers between data and people. So when you talk a lot about open data, you're talking about taking data out of the silos that people you know, can't look into and see what's available and bringing it into a public platform where you have much greater transparency. And we're really trying to bring the network effect to the data space, both technically in terms of linking data, semantic web that Tim Berners-Lee talks about a lot, but also the social network of people who work in data. Um, so it allows you to join, indicate some interests, connect with other people that have similar interests, collaborate in public or in private on, on open data projects. Um, so if you're interested in more, I have a sheet uh, which is features and benefits about data.world. It's free to join and you can go and join. And even though we're already tens of thousands of members, uh, it's still early days and you can get that cool handle that you wish that you had grabbed on Twitter or GitHub or, or MySpace. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you today about the history of the open data movement in the US and kind of the, the big narrative arcs are going from kind of high level concepts about open data and transparency and things that kind of are like strong suggestions over time to being increasingly specific with very firm requirements backed by the power of law. Um, so the, the, the first ground zero of the US government open data movement was Barack Obama in the first day of his first term in 2009 issued a memorandum on transparency and open government. So you actually think about like, you know, you're the new president on the very first day, what memo you issue, it's talking about the philosophy of transparency and open government. Um, so I, I highlighted a few sections here, which is the opening sentence of your first memo in your first day, your term is, my administration is committed to creating an unprecedented unprecedented level of openness in government, and government should be transparent. So that comes up repeatedly, transparency and openness, and that they really want it to be collaborative and participatory with the citizens, realizing it's not just in the ideal world a one-way push of data, that you actually have that loop, citizens are working on it, make, making progress, feeding back into the government, giving insights, challenging them to improve policy, challenging them to improve the quality of their data. Um, and at the end of the memo, he basically says, okay, you know, I need a directive, I need a firmer plan, and so the Office of the CTO and the OMB and GSA need to come back in 120 days with something more specific than this kind of, you know, philosophical statement. So 300 days later, <laughs> um, uh, they come back with um, something that's increasingly specific, still not terribly specific or ambitious, but continuing like the, the, the themes of having it be open. So they're trying to increase accountability, um, they're trying to increase government efficiency, and they're trying to unlock economic value. So these three points come up repeatedly and are actually points that are shared from kind of administration to administration, which is there is in a very deep level of being a democracy, we can agree that we should be transparent and open, right? I think nobody who lives in a democracy could disagree with that. Then it's about efficiency in government. Like the government, you know, in a lot of ways is not that efficient as evidence that it took them 300 days to put together a long memo that they were ordered to do in 120 days. Um, and that also it unlocks a lot of economic value downstream. I'm sure we're all familiar with the impact on weather data, um, census data, demographic data, and all the businesses that have been built on top of that, those data streams. Um, so the directive, which is more than a memo, um, in terms of, of you know, teeth and strength, comes out and says, you know, we need to publish it, 
online. It needs to be pretty good, better than it is, improve quality of government information. We're working to create a culture now of open government. That has to be as important as anything else. And then the last one is, let's start thinking ahead of what's a policy framework, what's a legislative framework to give this more permanence than either a memo or a directive has. So in the meantime, and actually before they came out with this directive, they went ahead and launched data.gov, which you guys have data.gov.uk, which is a repository of federal data. Um, so the office of the CTO, you know, to his credit, said, I'm not waiting for a directive, I'm just launching this. Um, and it started with 47 data sets. Um, it's now grown to 190,000 data sets. Um, I think you guys uh, uh, at data.gov.uk have about 45, 50,000. So similar in sc uh, size if you kind of adjust for population. Um, they don't host the data themselves. The individual agencies are still responsible for hosting and updating the data. Really, data.gov is sort of a kind of aggregator of the metadata uh, and links to the individual data. And it's all powered by open source technologies by CCAN, the same as data.gov.uk. Um, and they publicly share their code on GitHub. So even on the technology level, um, they're uh, embracing the concept of openness. Um, one point I failed to make actually on the earlier slide from the original memo from Obama, the last one was talking about embracing technology to drive solutions. So in the US, we actually think about President Obama as being our first technology president. So he really pushed the, the government to modernize for IT. He instituted new programs uh, like 18F and Presidential Innovation Fellow that brought in leaders from private sector, particularly technology, created the office of the chief data scientist that had never been created before and put the, the world's most famous data scientist in there, DJ Patel. Um, but you know, we know the folks at data.gov quite well. We've talked with them a bunch. They are under-resourced. Um, and they understand their own limitations. And I think we applaud them for what they've achieved, but I think like most you know, type A people that are trying to drive change, they look at what they're not yet that they want to be. Um, so uh, they want to improve it beyond how it is now, which is simply files and lots of it are in PDF and correct metadata. Um, so now we're moving forward, like we've had a memo, we've had a directive, but now we have an executive order, and that, that has real teeth. Um, as an interesting aside, actually, there's some, some constitutional debate in the US whether the president actually has the power to give executive orders or not, and it depends on whether you're a strict interpretist or not, um, but it's been a tool that has been used for a long time, um, and they really have pretty substantial weight within the administration of that president. They tend to not live very long beyond the, the, that administration, particularly if there is a, a regime change. Um, so what this really did, though, was you see the language is that it makes open and machine readable the new default for government information. So a lot of government, a lot of information that was put out on data.gov and still today, it's the enforcement is, is fairly spotty. You know, you see the last quote there, which is, I, I kept this anonymous, but somebody that we know is a chief data officer in the federal government, is unfunded mandates get spotty compliance. Um, so it's, it's fairly elective. There's kind of, a, kind of a low bar to clear to not get in trouble with the president's office, right? And a lot of times they're not updating or refreshing the, gov the, the data. They're putting it up at PDFs, which are really not that useful. But then you have other agencies that really embrace the notion, and they're the ones that are putting out a lot of data, updating it, looking to do innovative programs. And I'll share a few of those uh, shortly. But it goes back to the executive order citing the principles of open government that you've seen from the memo to the directive to here, which is really transparent democracy, efficiency in government, and economic value, you know, economic growth. Um, and you'll see the last point, which was by the GovLab index, which is talking about open data in general, uh, which is saying only 7% of open data is published as machine readable, um, which is pretty horrible. Um, so now we're moving to another level, which is legislation. 
Um, and this does have permanence. This does live beyond the administration. And the first one that came out was the Data Act of 2014, which is Digital Accountability and Transparency Act. And you see the quote from Forbes that says, the passage of the Data Act is a major advance in government transparency. And, and the, the point was to make federal expenditures, federal spending, transparent and accessible. And this passed unanimously in Senate and Congress. And very few things pass unanimously in a politically charged environment. At the time, it wasn't nearly as politically charged as it is now, but it still had total bipartisan support because who can disagree with those notions? Who wouldn't want the government to be more efficient spending taxpayers' money? Uh, and part of this was having very clear data standards. Before, you could get away with, oh, I'm reporting it, I'm putting it up whatever format I like, I'm putting it on PDF. This was incredibly clear. It has to follow this format called XBRL uh, for interoperability. It's machine readable. Um, anybody in the audience knows XBRL? No? OK, a little bit. Yeah. It's, uh, it, like any new format or standard, people complain that it's not good enough. But at least you're putting the standard out there for people to iterate off of. And even the SEC, which manages the Security Exchange Commission, which manages public companies, uh, publicly traded companies in the US are thinking about requiring that same XBRL format so public companies have to file their financials in that same format. So now you're getting to a world where there's data standards, machine readable, it's even linkable, and that's where you're getting to a bit of like the bright future that uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee has painted for a long time around creating a web of, of linked data. This is, I think, a big stride in that direction around financial data. But, you know, like most things in government, uh, it takes a long time to get there. So this was passed in 2014. Just past month, in May 2017, we hit the first major milestone, which was all of the agency's CFOs need to begin reporting their financial data uh, uh, according to those standards. And, and most of them did. There were a few that, that didn't meet the deadline and were publicly shamed. Um, and then a year from now is the second major milestone, which is now gets published on usaspending.gov for anybody in the world to access with wonderful APIs. Um, and it'll have a year of data uh, of all these agencies. Um, so that, that, was, that was great advance. The, the other thing that's actually in play right now is the Open Government Data Act, which is not yet passed. And the acronym for open, the O means open. Um, public, electronic, necessary. I think they were trying to force fit some <laughs> words into the acronym open. You know, but I think open is, is the concept of license, public access, electronic, machine readable. And necessary gets to the point of you have, to, you have to share all of your data. There's a high hurdle for any data you say is private or confidential and is not to be shared publicly. Um, there's the, basically this takes the executive order making machine readable and open by default and putting it into legislation. Uh, and this actually unanimously passed Senate at the, the final session, the final day of the final session in 2016, right in the middle of one of the most highly you know, charged political environments in, that I can remember in my lifetime in the US. And it passed unanimously in Senate. Um, and it's going through the process in Congress, and it's, it's very favorable. So it again gets back to those same notions, and there's a little bit of a, a, a pivot on a little bit of the, the language, but it's those three same principles that nobody can fundamentally disagree with. The, the aspects of implementation is where they get hung up. But, but it's, uh, I'm very optimistic that this will be passed, and like the Data Act, it'll have a slow rollout, but we'll get to a world in the future where Data is coming out. There's requirements for refresh. It's machine readable. It's following common standards. Um, so uh, I'm going to highlight a few uh, short case studies of different agencies in the government while they're following the requirements of these different uh, memos and directives. We've worked with various agencies in the US government that had more of that innov innovator's mindset. Uh, they want to do something that's beyond the requirements. They want to show what's possible. So the White House last year had something called the Opportunity Project. Uh, and the concept was if you gave the data and some great tools to citizens, they were going to solve a lot of their own problems. Um, and they 
put out uh, a number of curated data sets. There were over 300 data sets from 11, 11 federal agencies and I guess 12 cities um, because people want to localize solving the problem. And they also put out these problem statements as opposed to what often occurs, which is like, here's some data, go do something with it. They actually put together the hypotheses and enabled people with the data and the tools to try to solve it locally. So an example of that was an opportunity uh, problem statement around access to public transportation um, in urban environments and whether that had an impact on economic opportunity. You know, so they had you know, information on city level, city of San Diego, Chicago, Boston, um, other demographic data, and you're able to do some analysis to see whether certain neighborhoods that had a hard time getting to public transit had higher levels of unemployment and lower levels of income. So that was an example of doing that. So Data.World was one of many technology companies including Airbnb, LinkedIn, uh, AWS that, that participated in this. And really what we were doing was providing an enhanced data workspace. So instead of just finding the file on a .gov somewhere and downloading it to your machine, you had a public platform with tools where you can collaborate in the data, you can have discussions, you can share your scripts. If you're a data scientist, you can share your visualizations and have more of that collaboration. Um, Another partnership that we did was with the U.S. Census, which is one of the most valuable data assets uh, the U.S. government has. You know, may well be the most valuable. Um, it actually, you'll see the underlying statement there, uh, this kind of blew my mind a bit, which is it provides vital information that helps determine how more than $400 billion in federal and state funds are distributed each year. So the American Community Survey is their big annual household survey that, that is leveraged by all sorts of researchers, nonprofits, government entities, and, and corporations as well as they're trying to get idea around demographics. Um, so we worked very closely with them and built the first linked data representation ever of the, the ACS survey and put a schema and ontology on top of it to make it much more linkable to other data sets. So previously, it was a very arduous process. It was unclean data. You had to download it from an FTP. So it created much more usable data asset. Um, and we also did a lot of work around geocoding. You know, there's like five different major types of geocode. The zip, one, zip code is the one that most consumers in the US know publicly, but there's other codes like the FIPS. And um, so it's a, an ability to kind of crosswalk from geocodes and join data sets. Um, so that was a big uh, piece of, of work. And the US Census, which is part of the Commerce Department, which is one of the largest agencies uh, in the US government, has been one of the areas that were really innovative, tr innovators trying to think about how they could embrace open data and prove downstream economic benefit. Uh, and the last one I'll share here uh, today is a partnership we did with the Department of Defense, which is not somebody you would think about as embracing the notion of open data. But they had aggregated very painstakingly over time this big data set called the Thor data set, which is a theater history of operations, which was all aerial bombardment um, from World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Um, and what they really wanted to do was have a first pilot program for open data. Um, they wanted to develop user stories. So instead of just having the data that you could download on data.mil, they wanted to have it on data.world, where again, people are collaborating in public, having a discussion, sharing analyses. Uh, and that's really what happened. It ended up having like pretty amazing um, dialogue. If you go on to data.world, you know, there's the four data sets, but like the discussion that goes back and forth and the analysis and uh, really quite fascinating. Um, it's already been used to find unexploded ordnance in Southeast Asia, people analyzing the data to figure out where there might be uh, some unexploded bombs. Um, and then the last one is all of our, you know, data sets have their own dedicated endpoint. So people have developed, that's this picture here, have developed applications elsewhere on the internet that pulls from the underlying data set. And this was a rather mind-blowing one where you had like four different types of aerial missions like reconnaissance, bombardment, supply, and they overlaid it on a map of Southeast Asia over time. So you could literally see it march along and see the nature and location of aerial missions over the Southeast Asian conflict. So anybody who's kind of a you know, his history nerd uh, would really love that. So it was, it was a fun project and they're already moving on to their next open data project. Um, 
So now to the, the current day, um, you know, as you guys know, and I've referenced a few times, we were in a pretty uh, charged political environment, as you guys are too. Um, uh, misery loves company, so thanks. Um, <laughs> uh, Trump, one way or the other, has never said the words open data. Like, it's not in his radar of things he's trying to deal with. Like, he's got a whole bunch of stuff on his plate. He doesn't think about open data at all. Um, Though various members of his administration have made public comments about the concept of open data, and they're all in support of it. Because again, it goes back to some of those fundamental notions. They talk a little bit less about like transparency in government, like go democracy, but they talk a lot about the government's really inefficient. Um, and if, for those of you who followed the presidential election, one of Trump's mantra was, was drain the swamp because the Washington DC was built on a swamp a long time ago and it's sometimes referred to a swamp disparagingly when you're talking about like the embedded kind of like political culture. So it's part of like drain the swamp, like let's be more efficient and we'll be more efficient through data and transparency. Um, and Trump is investing a ton in IT modernization. They view the key question around efficiency is that technologically they're just way behind the curve. So while he hasn't publicly talked about open data, at least in terms of his leaders, uh, those that are in place, because you might see that bullet point that the chief technology officer, the chief data officer, and the chief data science officer, uh, chief data scientist, who are, are all vacant positions right now. Um, but you do see in his budget his investment in IT modernization and other investments like 18F. Um, but what is happening, and which hits the headlines, is uh, that politically charged data is at risk. So the, a lot of it has been focused around environmental and climate data. So uh, Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, has very publicly had some data taken down. There have been lots of fears. It'll be significantly more. There are a number of uh, you know, concerned citizens and organizations uh, in the world, ourselves included, that have just gone and grabbed all the data that's out there right now and holding it in a S3 bucket on Amazon. So in case it does disappear, we can put it out there because it is in the public domain under open license and access for anybody. So you can, you can fear, you can, you know, wring your hands about it going away, but why don't you just go grab it and, and, and keep your version of it in case it does. Um, there's other things around Department of Interior, climate change. There's other weird things for like OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration that might be viewed as like anti-corporate. So corporations that have had fines levied against them for certain activities, they've taken down those data sets. Um, so I think they don't want to publicly shame uh, corporations. Um, then there's some other ones in the Agricultural Department. And this is um, a screenshot of the White House's um, site, if you go there and you look for some public open data that used to be on the White House's website because it aligned with certain initiatives, it's no longer there. And you can, you know, on one hand, they can say, you can say, well, you know, it's because they want to take away that data and remove transparency. On the other hand, they say, well, it's a new administration. We kind of like delete a bunch of stuff from the old administration and to create room for our own. Um, but uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how we move forward. But we're more than cautiously optimistic because once it moves into legislation, it takes on a totally different tenor. Um, and there's lots of people that are, you know, government servants, um, not political appointees that believe in open data. And unless somebody actively blocks them or continuing to, to kind of do efforts there. Um, so that really takes me to the end of uh, my main presentation. Well, how are we for the, the time check? Good. So should we move to Q&A or, or, okay. All right, let's do that then. <laughs> Great, so thanks, Matt. Um, if you do have questions, let me know and I'll hand over the microphone. Anyone want to go first? Hi, thanks very much for that. I, I'm involved a lot in local government data in the, the UK. So I was interested in the standardization of financial data in XBLR format, which I think is a pretty generic format by legislation. You also talked about um, Opportunity Project and bringing in data from 12 cities. So my question is around standardization of non-financial data right. and the, what you've achieved in the US either through legislation or through voluntary contribution to bring together like those 11 data sets or across all local government administrations so that we can consume that data. Typically, the problem we have in the UK 
is that those of us that want to consume that data are not the same people who occur the cost for standardizing it and publicizing it. Yeah, yeah, great uh, question, well said. The, so the short answer is what have we achieved outside of financial data from standardization and the, the truthful answer is not much. Um, there have been some open source efforts. The guy who's actually the chief architect of data.gov has put out as an open source project um, something around uh, 311 data, which is basically information calls to city governments. So if you talk to city governments, one of their most interesting data sets is when citizens call in and ask for stuff, you know, information, what are they asking for? How do you categorize it? It shows kind of the nature, you know, it's a pretty interesting data set. Um, so there are lots of people that are interesting, interested in potentially benchmarking cities against each other for this type of data, but yet they don't follow any of the same standards. And when you get the cities around the room, you know, they, they can't agree on, on much. So, you know, a guy who is a government official, but as an individual, um, has put out this, uh, I forget what it's called, I think it might be Open 311, a standard there. So I think, you know, the, the concept of ontologies and standards is one we haven't cracked yet, and it's, and it's a network effect. And you're hoping that there'll be enough big nodes that decide to adopt even an imperfect standard that it has a, like a gravitational pull to other players. And the smaller guys will say, ah, maybe it's not perfect, but I'm, I'm gonna follow that standard because at least I know the city of Boston, the city of Chicago are already utilizing it. And I know my data is suddenly interoperable uh, with theirs. Uh, hi, um, I'm Robert from the Open Data Charter. We're a collaboration of governments and experts working to open up data <laughs> around some shared principles. Um, we're doing a bit of a project looking at how uh, leading open data officials within government embed open data programs and openness within government, particularly during times of political uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So I'd be really interested from the conversations that you're having with people within government, um, what tools and techniques have they found have worked to try and embed it? Obviously, you've talked about law, which is a great one, right. but are, are there other tools or techniques that they've used to try and do that? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't have any, any you know, kind of tight explanation or description of what people have done. I think some of it gets down to good leadership principles. You sometimes have leaders that are able to paint the vision of why it's valuable. Um, and get people aligned with that mission. And I think that's actually true in corporations as well. You look at leadership within corporations, and the ones that are most effective are the ones that can paint a vision of why something matters. Matters in the world, matters to them, and gets people behind that. So I think the ones, the people I've seen who are, are being effective today are able to create that culture. Um, and in often cases, you know, you have other things that even though they're government officials feel like, you know, just citizens congregating amongst themselves. They kind of self-identify who are the other folks that really care about it and they get together regularly, they share learnings, they share resources, and maybe kind of create some of those first nodes to, to, to get to a tipping point in a network effect. But I don't know how much that answers your question. It's pretty high level, but <laughs> yes. I promised you a question. Here's yes. mine. Yes, all right. Um, <laughs> You have described how you work with providing open data, how to make it accessible. But the other end, having s encouraging someone to actually do something with it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some good examples from Europe. Uh, Alex and I, we work with a company called Techio. We mm -hmm. work with technology transfer. And uh, how do you bring forth the entrepreneurs, the people with good ideas who could make something useful, like bringing out forth apps, like bringing right. forth... Um, do, you ha do you have a solution? How do you work with this in the U.S.? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. We talk about corporate, we call it corporate data philanthropy, not just us, but other folks out there. And because there's tremendously valuable data out there that corporations have generated that would be you know, of great use to different initiatives, other commercial initiatives, but also public causes. And um, you know, we've tried to be a voice alongside with other folks. There's a woman, a Mallory Soldner from uh, UPS, who has a TED Talk. I don't know whether you've seen that. She's got a fantastic TED Talk on this. And she worked at UPS to get some of their data, some data from a telecommunications company to optimize humanitarian food delivery. Uh, in, in places in Africa. You have other examples like Syngenta that has shared a lot of agricultural efficiency data out there from like 
4,000 farms and, and several hundred countries across like, you know, crop, climate, um, and that's benefited all sorts of farms and food production. So you can say like, you know, yay, that's great for the world, producing more food, particularly in, in, in third world environments. Um, and so there's been some examples like that. Um, and even Uber in the US, it's a little bit of a, a maligned company in terms of like local government, but they've been sharing some of their transport data recently that a lot of city planners are really interested in getting to know kind of tr movement and traffic and services. Um, so I, I think you, it's a little bit of, of you have to, there's a social pressure, uh, particularly from companies that purport to have some sort of heart that are trying to impact society. And you really need to get to somebody pretty senior and say, look, this is what these other companies have done. And you say in your mission statement, and you kind of have to call them out, it's like a, a persuasion technique, you said, <laughs> right? Um, and I think that's, that's the way you do it. And it's a little bit like one at a time. Um, I think there are particular sectors that are more scared of this than others, you know, like financial services, health, medical. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, it's a bit of a one at a time, but I think you get a little bit of a arithmetic like advantage over time as you get social proof. Sorry, I didn't have anything like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I see that you had some things that you done with the previous administration. How much of that was because you had good contacts in that administration, and are those avenues still open to you now, or is mm -hmm. it going to be more difficult now? Yeah, it's a fair question. Um, a lot of the folks that are that work in open data programs are actually career employees at this point. So there's still the embedded culture in a lot of places, people that have lived through multiple administrations and they, they're, they've got their initiatives and they're, they're kind of full steam ahead. Um, so you try to identify the right uh, federal employees that are not political appointments. Um, but you can still work with high-level politicians on either side of the fence. It is about having the right message. So we're working right now with a Republican congressman from Texas um, who is one of the sponsors of a major bill around IT modernization about the government investing a lot more in information infrastructure. Um, and he believes in the value of open data. So I think it's, it's you have to position your message a little bit differently, um, but you do have to build those relationships. And unfortunately, when they, there's a administration change, you have to build new relationships. And transparently, we've been trying to hard at work trying to build relationships with the new Trump administration, but because of the, the turmoil of it, and frankly, the vacant offices, there's no, I mean, we got to be close with the chief technology officer, the chief data scientist, you know, of the Obama administration. We were involved in their, their office, and all of those political appointees have rolled over, and we haven't been able to build those relationships yet, but we're trying. But we still have the relationships with the, the longtime public servants that are marching along still to the, you know, following their, their vision of what open data can mean. So, but a lot of work still to be done, for sure. Me. I'm quite interested in um, your interpretation of the role of um, uh, an organization like Data World or AWS and their public data sets in um, providing access to, to public data or, or data collected by government. What, mm -hmm. Where do you see that sort of long ter longer term? Yeah, so for us, for data.world, you know, we don't see ourselves as a replacement for data.gov or the city of Boston. We're really an extension for them, so we're not competitive with them, or in fact, a CCAN implementation or so Crowd or Open Data Soft that provides services for cities or agencies to publish their own open data portal. But we really see ourselves as a platform where a lot of the open data is coming together. And frankly, there's a lot more technical capabilities on our platform to work in the data live as opposed to finding it, downloading it. It's like you can do a lot more on the platform and, and looking at a data dictionary, making suggestions, having a discussion, uh, running you know federated queries against multiple data sets on our platform, using our APIs to take it out. So it's, it's more of a robust tool. Um, and in fact, when you talk to some of the governments, they don't want a lot of the social aspects on their site because they're afraid for two reasons. One, somebody's going to post in a discussion on doc, a .gov website something that 
you know, could be negative or disparaging. And then what's their obligation? They can't leave it there because then the next citizen comes along and sees it and might interpret that as like an official statement of the government. But they can't just take it down because that's big brother, you know, uh, squashing the voice of the citizen. You know, so they don't want to have that discussion going on. And, and funnily enough, um, one, uh, one government agency we spoke to said, we don't want to have people asking us stuff on our website because it might technically constitute a Freedom, Freedom of Information Act request. So if somebody asks us a question like, hey, can you clean up the format of the header? And they'd be like, oh, no, that's a FOIA request. I actually now have to enter the whole like FOIA compliance mechanism. So, um, and then AWS, um, you know, they're, they're providing massive like compute hosting infrastructure to the government. We actually work with them on the, the U.S. Census partnership I talked about. So we built this massive linked data graph representation of U.S. Census. And frankly, it's too large for us to host on our site and allow people to query against. So we create like tabulations for people to ask. Like here's U.S. Census about gender data, like demographic employment. Um, but AWS is hosting the entire linked data graph there because they know it's such a massive data asset that to be able to do anything with it, you actually have to employ some of AWS's services. Um, so they see it, that, so that's their whole, AWS's whole open data set approach is to bring in these high value, massive data sets that you really need AWS's incredible like uh, stack and, and infrastructure to, to work with. Hi, uh, my name's Dan from Get the Data. I uh, surface um, open data, aggregating surface open data. Mm -hmm. And my question is uh, businesses such as mine and businesses such as your own have placed a bit of a bet on uh, governments opening up um, their data sets. Um, and a risk to both our businesses is uh, that that trajectory of opening up is not going to continue in the direction we want it to continue in. Um, so my question really is, is it is it incumbent on us and other people within the community to be proving the value economically and civically of the data that has been opened mm -hmm. up? And if it is incumbent upon us, is that something on data.world's radar? And do you have any ideas about how we might go about doing that? Yeah, great point, great question. Um, yeah, so two points there. One is I actually think the risk, the long-term risk for us is not whether like the data, open data won't win, it's really the timeline that'll win. I think there might be some bumps along the curve, but I mean, we, all, most things migrate towards open, like open beats closed. Um, so I fully do believe in a bright open data future, whether it happens on a timeline that works for us <laughs> or whether it happens you know, uh, past uh, a, a, you know, a point where we're in the graveyard, like who knows, but it's gonna, it's gonna happen. Um, the, 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 the other point is, and you, you really hit the nail on the head is, I, I, the way we characterize it is we're at the tail end of the open data 1.0 era, which was mostly like, let's just get the data out there, right, in whatever form it's in, right? It doesn't matter, you know, if it's in PDFs, better than nothing, like, you know, if it's machine readable with horrible headers and codes, it's better than PDFs, right? You just get it out there. Um, but in our conversations with a lot of folks, including, you know, the federal government, is they're trying to prove the ROI of their open data programs. Like it's great if the legislation comes because it kind of forces them, but for them to really justify the expense, particularly if it's unfunded, um, they need to have those user stories, which is part of why the op Opportunity Project had it on our site and uh, data.mil uh, data had it on our site. They want to capture that conversation to be able to say, look, this was the output of it because otherwise you're just looking at what we describe as interest indicators. Oh, how many people came to this page with this data set on my site? How many views did I get and how many downloads? And that's the metrics they use now to track the success of their open data program. What they really want to do is to your point, which is they want to track the impact. Uh, they want to move from interest metrics to impact metrics uh, and be able to see what were the downstream benefits of it. And it's okay, like they're happy just with user stories. They don't want it to be, they don't, it doesn't, doesn't need to be kind of quantified perfectly. They just kind of want the anecdotes now. And I'm sure once they have the anecdotes, they'd want to quantify it further as the kind of a, the evolution. But yeah, you're absolutely right. 
So the more, the more we can do that, the better we're helping the, and I see that ODI, ODI has a great section on their website, which is like, you know, ODI, like case studies around the impact of open data. And frankly, as an open data community, probably the best thing we could do together is capture and package more of those stories of great things uh, commerce and society has done with this, this data, because you really kind of need both. Um, and that's, that's the one, if we could do one call to action collectively, I think that would be the right one to do. Great, so we've got time for one more question, I think. Um, I, I missed the very beginning, so apologies if you've already addressed this, but um, I was wondering, so since the election, I'm American and I've been following super closely all the crazy stuff. Um, <coughs> and I know in a lot of my, at least my kind of social networks, people have become much more engaged and there have been a lot of new services launched to help people kind of understand how their representatives are voting or what's going on. Do you think that that's a good opportunity to show, kind of demonstrate the real world value of open data and how it's a really good thing if we can understand better kind of what's going on behind the scenes and what's going on politically? Yeah, it's a good question. And actually there is the, the thing I was going to show in the appendix we had times directly to that point, which is around trust in media right now. And, you know, there was a uh, event at Chatham House last night talking about fake news. Um, and, you know, somebody made the counterpoint of saying, well, actually, in this environment where a lot of people are very upset and emotional, we're having, like, very high levels of voter turnout, so the population is more engaged than ever. But we actually did a survey um, asking people in the U.S., do you trust media? When they s report stats and facts, do you trust media? And 50% said no or very little. But then when you ask that same question saying, what if you shared access to the underlying data? Um, would that improve how much you trusted the media source? And 77% across all different uh, political kind of bents uh, believe the media more if they were sharing the underlying data and analysis. So I actually think there is an, uh, an opportunity and a bit of an obligation for media as it's reporting, particularly things that are, you know, you're citing data or stats or you have a f great infographic that captures something, is share the underlying statistics so other people can jump in and analyze it. And I think that engages the citizens but also um, gives people an opportunity to, to test the media, build upon it, and challenge it. Um, great. Well, thank you, everybody. It was a, lo a lot of fun talking with you today. It was a lot of fun actually putting this together. Um, and uh, for those of you um, who are sticking around and know a lot about the UK open data story, I know some of the highlights, but I'd love a reciprocal education on what you think are some of the main, main narrative highlights. So thanks.